Growing up as an Adventist, from a child, I usually hear that there's one distinct message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is the three angels' messages. As a matter of fact, before the official logo for the church that is right now, the logo that was used was one with the three angels the blow the trumpet. Any Seventh-day Adventist document, as a matter of fact, the church signs, they all would have that logo, that emblem placed there. Uh, it became incumbent on the church to find a logo for themselves when uh, in recent times, maybe, maybe close to 20 years ago, I'm thinking, but you know in this time of uh, intellectual property and all of that, this logo didn't belong to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so one was developed for the church. But suffice it to say, before that, the one that was used as their identifying logo for the Seventh-day Adventist church was the one with the three angels. So this is something that has long been established in our church. Now, I uh, remember as well, and some of you may be able to recall, I don't know if you used to watch it, there was a particular television series and it was touched by an angel. Now, this lady was an angel, you know, and would uh, go into the lives of people and always has a message of hope for them. And invariably, when she revealed, oh, I'm an angel and, you know, I've come here to give you this message, she usually gets a positive response. People like to hear from angels. Some messages might come and I would be speaking to someone and they would tell me, look, God would have to come down and tell me that himself. If an angel came and told them, they'd be very receptive. People are very home to angels. And I'm saying, we have messages from an angel, from angels here. And uh, sadly, I, I decided to focus on this today because I started to realize that the things that we enjoyed as youngsters growing up, sadly our children may be missing out because I hardly hear this mentioned in church at all. So is it really a thing? Is it really a doctrine? Sometimes you tend to wonder. Uh, let me put it this way, I, my father, I didn't really have a close connection with my father. My father had a twin brother. And uh, I remember when I was small, I might have heard that my father had a twin, but after a time, I, I wasn't so sure. Because I never met the man. I, you know, and you might hear it mentioned once and then it wasn't a recurring theme. So after a while, I wasn't even too sure that my father really had a dream. But when I became sure, it was the only time that I saw him, and it was in his casket. That's the only time I ever saw him. Before that, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. It was, in reality, it was so. But I wasn't sure. Now, if we have these uh, doctrines, uh, these things that are expounded in the Bible, and our children grow up, <laughs> grow to teenagers, maybe even into adults, and they never heard it, they might be sure. I'm not sure. Is it really so? So I'm thinking it's important that we speak of it and forget about children. I dare say there are 
Adventists who would have accepted the message and this might be foreign to them, I would not be surprised. So uh, today we will just spend a few minutes looking at what the Lord has to say to us. Now, we usually say when you read the Bible, this is the last message to mankind recorded in the scriptures. After this, there is no other. This is for us, the end of time. So, my topic, message from an angel. Now, the message is found in Revelation 14, verses uh, 6 through 12. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. And it says, and I, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And uh, worship Him who made that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And uh, third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with all mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, testing. Is this, this working? Amen. Amen. Okay. So here we find, recorded in Revelation chapter 14, three angel messages. But the message itself, it didn't just stand on its own. It was a build-up until you got to the message. And, and the build-up started in uh, Revelation 12. Revelation 12, if we look at the background, Revelation 12 verse 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And uh, in the Bible, the church, the religious organizations are oftentimes referred to as women. So in uh, Jeremiah 6 verse 2, you would hear it says, I like in the daughter of Zion to a delicate and a humble woman. And uh, the church oftentimes is referred to as the bride of Christ. And you know, you hear of the daughters of Zion. Women. Church is usually referred to many times so in Revelation 12 verse 1 it says John says there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and verse 2 says she being with child travailing in birth and came to be delivered verse 5 says she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. The first reference I would think that was made to this woman.
woman no. would be way back in Genesis. In Genesis 3, verse 15, when God says, I will say to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And I would submit here, she be with child, with, with child, cried. So she was with child. In verse 5 it said, she brought forth a man child. She brought forth a seed. Genesis 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman. Now, her child was caught up unto God <coughs> and to his throne. Okay, so that's what was first painted in Revelation 12. Then we see something else in Revelation 12. Verse 3, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. Bear that in mind. And seven crowns upon his head. Verse 4 says, and he still drew third part of the stars of heaven and we pass into the earth. And it says the dragon stood before the woman. And what was his intent? Which was ready to be delivered. His intent for to devour her child as soon as it was born. But verse 5 said her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So, obviously, that plan didn't work because the child did come and eventually was caught up to God. Verse 9, though, of Revelation 12 tells us, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So, we know who the dragon is. Verse 3 again, there appeared another one there in heaven, behold, a red dragon, who we'll just said who it is, having seven heads and ten horns. So there is painted a picture of a conflict in Revelation 12 between the dragon and the woman, or I'd say the scene of the woman. But John goes on to explain that the conflict didn't just begin there. The conflict in verse 7 of Revelation 12 says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against who? The dragon. So the dragon was in heaven and he was fighting. The conflict began in heaven. And it says, the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Verse 13. When the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now, in Jamaica, there is a saying that a man would say, if you can't catch quapo, they catch him short. That means, this is a, 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 a mob mentality. So, I have a gambit bit to the mob. But I know that I'm in trouble. I, I, I can't pay. So, you know what? I kind of disappear. But when they come to collect and they can't find me, do you think they are going to be satisfied with that? They are saying, hold on. Doesn't he have a wife? Doesn't he have children? Doesn't he have a mother? If you think it's going to be like that, if I cannot catch you, someone else will have to pay the price. This is what is being brought out here. When the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the child. Because remember, the child was caught up to heaven and to God and to his throne. So the conflict which began there is now here. And uh, Unfortunately, we are all caught up in it. Whether we like it or not, we are all caught up in this conflict. 
The last verse in Revelation 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So that's where it started. In Revelation 12, it depicts the conflict what was going on and how we became involved. Now, in Revelation 13, Revelation 13 describes uh, how the war is carried out, the strategy that was employed. And uh, we will see just how, you know, how it all played out, how it all plays out, I should say. So, in Revelation 13, verse 1, John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his ten horns the name of blasphemy. Now, he didn't say he saw the dragon. He saw a beast, right? Well, what's a beast? What is a beast? If we look in prophecy, if you look in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, there were four beasts that were revealed there. And verse 17 of Daniel chapter 7 said, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23 of Daniel 7 said, Thus he said, so he started to talk about one, beast number 1, 2, 3, and 4. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. And verse 24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So, beasts, used in Daniel, in prophecy, refers to king or a kingdom. In Revelation 13, verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So, the beast, a kingdom, rising up out of the sea, and we don't have time to go into the significance of the sea and, and you know so I'm, I'm just going through the background leading up to Revelation 14 but in uh, Revelation 12 uh, Revelation 12 uh, yeah. verse 3 he appeared another one day in heaven and behold a red dragon having what? Seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 13, verse 1, the beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 2, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. What's being described here to me is I like it to a proxy. And a proxy most times is used, uh, I hear used in, in business terms. So I have shares in RBC. They have their annual general meetings. There are issues to be voted on. And I cannot be there. But I know Raman will be there. I can give him authority. Prophecy, the authority to represent someone else. So he can vote on my behalf. I give him authority to vote on my behalf. So I'm not there. But I'm there in the form of him. And this is what I see being represented here. The dragon gave the beast his power, his seat, and great authority. Verse 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded unto death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. All the world wondered after the beast. W-O-N-D-E-R, not W-A-N. Now, wonder, as a noun, say it's a feeling of surprise.
admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. And we can all relate to that. You know, this is something unexpected. It, it's going to draw your attention. Something beautiful. It is going to draw your attention. On social media, you know, when someone has uh, something that they want to get your attention, they will put certain images or certain captions that will grab. Now, when you go in and you read, you're saying, what? how does that tie to this? No, they put something unfamiliar, something unexpected, you know, to grab your attention, inexplicably. So it, 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 it piques your interest. But it says the all the world wandered after the beast. So that is suggesting uh, an action word. It's present continuous, or right? some action word. So as a verb, then it's a desire or curious. The desire or curious to know something. But it was prophesied. All the world wandered after the beast. So curious. To know what is about this beast that's so special. We need to find out more. And they not only wandered after the beast. Verse 4 says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So in Revelation 4, 13, it, it, it speaks about how the war was raged, but not only that, it also, to me, identifies the end game. So, there's war. What are you fighting for? Is it turf? Is it money? But, what is the end game? And this starts to highlight that for me. <laughs> so verse 4, two things. They worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. Remember they wandered after the beast. But it was the dragon who gave the beast his power, his seat, and his authority. So John is saying, in essence, they worshipping the beast really is this one and the same thing as worshipping the dragon. And so we see in many instances, here are a few instances we are going to see the, need, the, the, the word worship come up again and again. And all that dwell on the earth, verse 8, shall worship him, which is the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, stated from the foundation of the world. So that's it. So that, 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 that was the first beast of Revelation 13. But Revelation 13 verse 3 says the beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he received a deadly wound. I think uh, the, yeah, I didn't have it there, but I think I gave you about verse 10. Told you about the, 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 the wound. And it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall be captive, or he that killeth in the sword shall be killed. Something like that. So that is when the beast received the deadly wound. But verse 11 speaks, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and his face as a dragon. And this second beast exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and he caused it the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should bow its feet, and cause as many as would not worship again, the image of the beast should be killed. And so we see it going back over and over. It's, it's all about worship. It's all about worship. And so if we look, the dragon was identified as the devil, Satan. And if we go back to Genesis again, the first appearance of the dragon, devil, Satan. First appearance he made in scripture. It was under the same lies. He did 
didn't appear as himself. He presented himself to Eve as a serpent. And Eve wondered after the serpent because she was caught. She said, oh, I didn't know a serpent could fly. A serpent can speak. It was something strange to her, unfamiliar. So it's the same playbook being used over and over again. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. And it's the same thing here. So Revelation 13 now you know, tells us the strategy that was used. It tells also the end game, what it is that he's after, which is worship. And then we look, well, as we finish Revelation 13, and he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the beast, or the number of his name. And so he uses uh, sophistry, he uses, you know, things to attract. But, invariably, what we have seen through history is uh, he'll attract many. He wants all. The ones who are not so attractive. He's not going to use sophistry on you. After that doesn't work, the next thing he turns to is force. We have seen it over and over again. And so, this is what is, you know, I think depicted in Revelation 13, the strategy that is used. And so then we go on to Revelation 14, which uh, the message, the angels, Revelation 14, verse 1 to 5, really speaks about 144,000, you know, who were not defiled and, and all of that. And then Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, here's where the angels have their messages. So, the first angel, Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7, as well as read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel, that's what he has, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. And here's what he's saying, saying, not whispering, with a loud voice, one, fear God, fear God, and give glory to him. So, the hour of his judgment is come. And as any one of these texts can aid and of itself a sermon preached on. Because the hour of his judgment, and these are things I don't think these people enough in church, where it speaks to the sanctuary message, what Christ is doing in the sanctuary and what it means for us. So the first angel says the hour of his judgment is come. And then the last thing that he says is worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of water. Worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of water. Now, this points me back to the, 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 the fourth commandment, I would say. Reference is here made to the fourth commandment, because what does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it all six days. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. See, in the fountain of waters, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, it's the same language here. It's pointing back to the fourth commandment. And, 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 and I dare say, not just the fourth commandment, the commandments. Because the first and the second commandments, what do they say? Thou shalt have no other God before thee. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down to them. Thou shalt not worship them. But in Revelation 13, we see where the dragon and the beast, they create worship. So it would be contrary to the commandments, the first few com two commandments. And so these first four commandments, you 
know, you know, is referring to love for God. So it really refers to the fourth commandment, but in the first four, the, 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 the worship of the beast and his image and the dragon is part of here. But the, 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 the first angel message where he said, worship people who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water, is really, in essence, pointing back to the fourth commandment. So the reference made to the fourth commandment. And what's significant is, as I said, why we even had to have uh, a logo for the Seventh-day Adventist Church itself, because if we continue using that old logo, the church would be open to litigation. I mean, persons could bring an action against you, sue, and you'd have to pay it because you're using their property, intellectual property. Now, intellectual property in this day and age is very important. It's come to the forefront. Property rights holders or content creators have rights to any royalties that flow from the use of their creation or their property. Royalty, I submit, in this context, is worship. When we come here today, it's not just an academic exercise. Back to Genesis. Lord finished creating, and he says, on the same day, he rested from his work, and he set it aside. He hollowed it. Hollowed something, he set it aside for holy use. So when I come here today, anyone who really understands what I am saying would never accuse me of believing in evolution. Yeah? Because this day is set apart to honor the one who created in six days. So the fact that I'm here is saying that I don't ascribe to the evolutionary theory. So me coming here is not just academic. It says a lot. It says something. And I'm saying royalty is due worship is due to the Creator. Now, the first angel is saying, look, what? what's going on? All this foolishness, the dragon and the beast and worship. He said, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he's saying with a loud voice, Look, fear God. He's the one that needs to be feared. And give glory to Him. He's the one who is due our worship. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of water. This other power is uh, it's a pirate, you know. He shouldn't be due royalty. Royalty belongs to Him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of water. And this is, you know, the essence of the first angel. So, it says it all comes down to a choice between the beast and his mark, as we saw before, and the Lord and his commands. No, as I said, Hallelujah! here it's not just Jesus. an academic exercise. Because if we look at that, if we see that, what does that represent? We wouldn't say that represents the United States, do we? No, that would be a different flag. It says something. It's a mark. It represents something. Now, there wouldn't be uh, many, say, persons who are born and go south of the border here who would be draping themselves in that flag. So, I'm a, 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 an Olympic runner, and I just won 100 meters race, and I am <coughs> from the United States, or even Jamaica. I would be grabbing a Canadian flag and drape myself in it, and run around and celebrate. No, that's not what I'm representing. This represents, you know, persons who are proud to be Canadians. As a matter of fact, when uh, the, as a Canadian and you represent your country and you
you're on the world stage and the Olympic is, you know, you just won the race and then, you know, the winner, the anthem of that country is played. Now, when you're standing there, you're going to be proudly singing your national anthem. The man who is second or third, he might show his respect. But, you know, yeah, but it, 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 it doesn't affect him the way it affects you. Because you identify with this. So, I'm saying it all comes down to whose mark are we going to accept? That's what the angel is saying. But then we go on to the second angel because time is we're running away with us. But the second angel, it says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And when I was reading that, I was like, how does that even fit there? It just doesn't seem to fit within the narrative that we have been looking at. Babylon, what is that? You know, I, I don't know. Babylon, a new word introduced here into the narrative. The question is asked, what does this represent? And how is it relevant to this discussion? But if you go further, in Revelation, in Revelation 17, verse 1, it's, you know, among other things, there's a, it says, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, we have some unflattering language here, and in today's day and age, uh, political correctness, certain words would be avoided. But that word, whore, it also represents a woman. What it might be saying, that woman, you know, there's something iffy about her character or, you know, her actions, whatever you would like to say. But it says, sit up on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So I'm saying, hold on, but the second angel, come on, don't do that. The second angel, there followed another angel, she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In Revelation 17, it talks about this horse that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. But that's the same thing I just saw. The second angel was saying. The very same thing. In verse 3, it says, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy. And here we go again, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, if you would have forgotten, let me remind you Revelation 12, Revelation 13, verse 1. First beast, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, which we see here, that, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So I'm saying, okay, the dots are starting to connect. The first piece of Revelation 30 speaks about, you know, the seven heads and the ten horns, and on the heads in the name blasphemy. But in Revelation 17, verse 3, speaking about this woman, this word, it says, full of names of blasphemy. Revelation 13, verse 1. Having seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 13, verse 1. The dots are starting to connect. So I'm saying, okay. I you know, can sort of see the relevance now of the second angel speaking. And so, Revelation 17, just the same, verse 5. Because it still hasn't said anything about Babylon. The second angel said, Babylon is falling, is falling. But verse 5 now is saying, upon her head. It's the same woman from verse 1 we are talking about. Depicted as a whore and the woman that's sitting in scarlet color and stuff and 
right now. Continues, and upon her head was written a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. So Babylon is here identified. So we realized earlier the, 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 the connection between the beast in Revelation 13 verse 1 and this same power. And then it continues to call Babylon the Great, the mother of Parliament abominations of the earth. So when the second angel is saying Babylon is falling, is falling, we can understand who the angel is referring to. It's here in Revelation 17. As a matter of fact, it goes on in Revelation 18. Revelation 18 verse 1 and 2 says Babylon is the great, is falling, is falling. That's repeated again. And then goes on further in verse 4 saying, Babylon is falling, and my invocation, my admonition is, come out of her, my people. Babylon is falling. Come out of her. Are you going to stick on a sinking ship? The Titanic is going down. Are you going to grab a, a life Are you going to go down with the Titanic? Come out of her, my people. That's what the second angel is saying. The third angel says, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mind in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And so basically, the third angel is following on the first angel. The first angel says, look, worship God, not the other. The second angel is saying, look, that kingdom is falling. That's a sinking ship. Come out of her. But in the third day, they are saying, well, if you don't decide to, you know, be the one, this is what is going to happen. Many times we, 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 we tend to shy away from this because this third day, the language is graphic, you know. It's not a pleasant end that is what, but there's a warning just to say, if we accept it, this is what is going to happen to us. And then... Last verse in the third angel, the last thing he says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Which casts me right back to Revelation 12, verse 17. The last verse of Revelation 12. It says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. That was the last verse before we went into Revelation 13, which identified the strategy that was going to be used. So, it is, they are referring to the remnant of the seed of the woman in Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, they refer here to us, here is the patience of the saints, the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, what is the message here? What is the message here for us? It is to remind us, you know, those of us who would have been familiar, and to introduce to us those of us who might not have heard anything like this before. We have to, you know, recognize our purpose. So, when uh, we become a part of an organization, we have to understand what, well, I wouldn't even say the tenets, tenets of the organization, but, you know, the core beliefs and, and, and where you are going and, you know, so these are things that you need to understand what it is you are a part of and decide whether or not this is for me. And I say, no, really? That's what, no, I, I have to find somewhere so I might say, whoa, this is interesting, tell me more. Fact is, we need to know exactly what it is that we believe in. Final admonition, and why I say we need to know what it is that we believe in, because it is saying that, they said that in the last days, God's remnant people shall make the, the, the loud cry mm -hmm. to those that dwell on the earth. Yes. To carry these same messages. Yes. To say Babylon is falling. Come out of her, 
my people. But many of us don't even believe it. Many of us don't know it. I've never heard it. Very skeptical. And as I said, even those, you know, would be in church maybe four or five years. And this would be new to them. I made reference to my uncle. I tell you, I wasn't really sure that I had an uncle who was my father's kid until he died and, you know, I heard that he died and I went to the funeral. That's when I was really sure. That's the first time I saw him. So, you would be here in church and if you don't know, how is it you are going to go and give and invite someone, come out of her, my people, when you don't know the message? We need to know. We need to study these things for ourselves. The same principle that God gave Moses over in Deuteronomy. This is the final admonition here. Children of Israel were going through the wilderness, going into the promised land. And when they were about to go, this is what God told them. He said to them, look, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 to 9, and I'm paraphrasing a few things here. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words that I command thee shall be in thy heart. So you need to ponder them. You need to keep them in your heart. That's one. Then, you need to teach them diligently to thy children. How are you going to do that? How about them when thou sit in the house? When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, that's how it's going to be passed on. Bind them for a sign upon thine hand. I can remember before, you know, these smartphones and stuff like that. I see Sister Margarita has one on. We used to walk around. Yeah, we have our wristwatch. And I'd go and I'd see someone and I'd say, oh, could you tell me the time? Okay, it's 12 o'clock. And I, I, I might have an appointment and I'd say, whoa, they're always late. That's an indication. Find them for a sign upon thy hand. It's going to give you that direction. Let them be frontlets between thine eyes. Write them upon the post of thy house and thy gate. So we should be saturated with these things that the Lord is saying to us. I am afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking to you. Or the, I'm talking to me. We have all slumbered. We have all slept. And it's time for us to wake up. You know? It's high time, you know, and give the trumpet a certain song. Because he that shall come, will come. He will not tarry. If we look around us, we can all agree that the Lord is so put in his appearance. So my admonition to you, you know, is you know that we ponder these things and we act upon them that when the Lord comes, we can hear well.